Um, so this morning, I guess wanted to just kick it off uh, and introduce um, our first two speakers. Um, so we have we have Ames Fowler. Ames grew up in the Palouse region where he was the first captivated by the challenge of balancing agronomical livelihoods and ecological health. He received a degree in civil engineering at Seattle University and a master's degree in civil engineering at WSU and is now working on his PhD at WSU. His research is focused on hill slope hydrology and erosion, asking the questions, how do we connect our me mechanistic understanding to conservation management and employment with a particular focus on identifying the reason of sediment and non-point pollution flows in time and space. In addition to his studies, Ames has his hands in the soil, owning and operating in the soil, owning and operating a far, small diversified farm, Hands and Hearts Farm. And so our second co-speaker is Ryan Boylan. Uh, Ryan is the research and monitoring coordinator at the Palouse Conservation District. He spent the last five years monitoring the effectiveness, effectiveness of conservation practices implemented in the Palouse River watershed. Prior to that, he worked at, for the Nez Perce tribe as a water resource specialist and completed an MS in water science management at the University of Idaho. Um, so I just want to welcome them both, and they're going to kick off their talk on hill slope hydrology and landscape patterns. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Um, can you guys all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. And you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. <laughs> All right, great. Well, thanks for uh, having us today. Yeah, uh, Ames and I are gonna spend some time talking about a project that we've been working on for the last couple of years. The title of our talk is Hill Slope Hydrology and Landscape Patterns. Um, I told Ryan in the beginning when we were setting up the presentation that if anybody has questions along the way, feel free to reach out or to answer them and even stop us as we go. Um, and we'll be happy to answer them then. And we'll also have time for questions at the end. Um, so before I jump into before I jump into uh, the meat of what we've been doing, I just want to uh, provide a little bit of background of where we're working and kind of what we're doing. Um, and so this is a photo of the Palouse. Um, I'm sure several folks in this room have seen photos similar to this before, but it's uh, one of the gems of Eastern Washington. It's kind of characterized by these rolling hills of windblown soils that are very fertile that have been farmed since the early 1900s uh primary it's primarily all dryland agriculture um, so no irrigation and the main crops grown are winter wheat spring wheat uh, barley canola and then legumes so garbanzo beans peas and lentils just to put it in context and like space, uh, this is the Palouse River watershed. Um, it kind of hugs the border of Washington and Idaho. Uh, and can you guys see my mouse? Yes, I can see it. it's a little small, but I can see it. Okay, yeah, so my blue mouse here. This is Pullman, Washington here. Uh, it's where WSU is. Uh, and then Moscow, Idaho, just here. Um, it's roughly 2.2 million acres and almost 90% uh, dryland ag. And so the Palouse kind of has this like rich history of soil erosion. Prior to 1970, it was estimated that for every bushel of wheat that was produced, three quarters of a ton of soil was lost. And the erosion rates ranged from 10 to 30 tons per acre per year. Um, and so there's all these amazing old photos of soil just washing over the, the hills and into the streams and rivers in the Palouse. Since the 1970s, there has been a lot of advances in farming practices and the conservation districts and NRCS have been working with producers uh, to implement direct seed and conservation tillage practices. So we've reduced those erosion rates from 10 to 30 to 2.5 tons per acre per year, which is awesome. Um, but if you think of it, 2.5 tons per acre per year is still a lot over 2.2 million acres. Um, and then also just one of the driving forces behind erosion, we all probably know this, but it's runoff, just water moving over the surface and washing with it uh, nutrients, so nitrate or phosphorus and sometimes pesticides into like the adjacent water bodies. And so to address some of these concerns in 2015, uh, the Palouse Conservation District and 19 partners came together to write uh, uh, the Palouse River watershed 
Regional Conservation Partnership Program grant through NRCS, we were awarded $10 million to improve water quality, soil health, and wildlife habitat um, in the Palouse River watershed. And the main objectives behind that were to implement 45,000 acres of conservation tillage, 450 acres of riparian buffers, and 530 acres of conservation easements. I just want to note the majority of the work that we do on the Palouse is um, working with producers to do conservation tillage and implementing riparian buffers. Um, and I know I'm preaching the choir here, but it's all voluntary incentive-based conservation, which is great. We have no regulatory authority. People come in our door, they have conservation goals in mind, and we help them to achieve it. But I just want you guys to keep this, the voluntary conservation in mind as I move forward and talk about where the projects are and how we're kind of trying to focus our efforts. And so again, this is just another map of the Palouse River watershed. Um, these lighter gray um, shapes there are smaller sub-watersheds or HUC-12 watersheds. And the ones with colors just indicate watersheds that we've installed conservation practices in between 1998 and 2019. Darker colors indicate higher densities of conservation practices in acres, and lighter colors indicate less um, conservation practices. Um, so you can kind of see the spread of that throughout the watershed. But then if we just put points on the map, um, you can kind of see where these projects are, and maybe some are focused in some watersheds, some aren't. Um, and this is what is known as the shotgun approach to conservation, which is what we've done for a really long time and continue to do. Like if someone comes in our door and is excited about a project, we're not going to turn away, right? Like we're going to help them achieve their conservation goals. Um, but in the early 2000s, there was this work that was done through a program, an NRCS program, called the Conservation Effects Assessment Project. Um, and a bunch of work done through this project came to this idea that you can kind of learn from the landscape to focus conservation practices. So that Conservation Effects Assessment Project, or SEEP, um, essentially what they did was they set up 23 watersheds all over the United States just to study um, how effective conservation practices were at improving water quality. And it just so happened that one of those watersheds was in our neighborhood. In, uh, we're based in Pullman, but this watershed is just outside of Moscow, Idaho, so seven miles to our east, um, in Paradise Creek watershed. And this is just a map of the agricultural portions of the watershed. Those different colors indicate just different combinations of slopes and soils. And what the researchers found in Paradise Creek watershed was that 1% of the watershed area, so those red blobs there on the map, created roughly 32% of the sediment yield. So one third of the sediment that was being eroded away was coming from 1% of the land. And this is what is known as a critical source area. And I'll just give a quick definition here. Uh, it's They're called a lot of different things, but we we, I guess, over here typically refer to them as critical source areas, but they're areas in the landscape that contribute disproportionately high pollutant levels as a result of a hydrologically sensitive area. Um, and in the case of the Palouse, it's usually steep slopes and shallow soils. And then when it intersects with a pollutant source, and so in our case, it would be uh, nutrients or pesticides or sediment eroding creates our critical source areas. And just before I move on um, to other things, I think it's important just to talk about how runoff is generated. Runoff is like one of the most important factors that creates erosion and moves, you know, non-point source pollutants into our streams. And a colleague of ours, Becky Rittenberg, um, she and a bunch of other folks put together this paper that kind of categorized how runoff is generated. So first here on the right, that box that's labeled A, that's what's called infiltration excess. So essentially what happens is rain falls faster than it can infiltrate into the soil and it runs off over the top. Um, and then we have our next one, which is B1. This is typically called saturation excess or like the spill and fill. So in our B1 scenario, there's a restrictive layer. So it could be like a clay pan or they're sometimes referred to as argillic horizons or fragipan soils. Just something in there that stops water from moving down um, percolating down into the soil. And so when rain falls, it fills up that soil profile above the restrictive layer and then flows over the surface. And you can kind of think of it as if you're holding a, a ice cube tray at an angle and filling it up from the top, it'll just fill and spill down. That's kind of how it works. And then the last thing um, 
a way to categorize runoff is just this B2 box, and that's just these really deep soils that rain will fall down and it'll just percolate down into the water table. Um, and just to put that in context, like for pa the Paradise Creek watershed, uh, those critical source areas that we pointed, I pointed out earlier, they would be these B1 so soils where there's saturation excess and some sort of restrictive layer. So yeah, steep slopes, shallow soils, it fills up the profile quick and then spills out. That B2 scenario, those like really deep soils um, could be shown in these blue boxes, the blue colors there. And then we don't typically have a ton of landscapes that have uh, infiltration excess because the rainfall intensities over here are just pretty low. Um, it can happen sometimes if there's like a plow pan or like some sort of uh, layer in the soil that's been plowed multiple times. Um, yeah, so that's, those are the mechanisms runoff. So once we're armed with all this knowledge, um, I started right when the Regional Conservation Partnership programs began and I was tasked with setting up a monitoring program to assess the entire Palouse River watershed, which is really hard. And so from a monitoring perspective, it's always easier to have like a smaller scale. And I knew, ha had all this information and we teamed up with a professor at Washington State University, his name was Jan Bull, and we wrote a grant through the Department of Ecology. Um, and the goal of that grant was to effectively prioritize and locate conservation efforts within the Palouse River watershed to achieve our water quality goals. So can we identify these critical source areas? And essentially what we're trying to do is move away from the shotgun approach to a more focused effort on the critical source areas in the watershed. So can we get like more bang for our conservation buck um, by just treating these areas that we know create more runoff and erosion? And now I'm gonna turn it over to Ames and he's gonna talk about uh, the nuts and bolts as to how we got that done. Thanks, Ryan. So as we think about where critical source areas are in the landscape, uh, like this picture here, um, see a lot of these photos are from alongside the road. Um, and it reminds us that it's really difficult on um, a watershed the scale we're thinking about to get this high resolution understanding of where critical source areas are by observation. Ryan's done a really great job putting together a monitoring program, and he just can't be everywhere at once looking at things, um, which leads us to simulation um, and the use of models. Let's go ahead and go forward, please. So the model that we're using that was used in the C project that Ryan set up for us is the Water Erosion Prediction Project, or WEP. It's a USDA model. It uses representative profiles, um, and uh, notably, it's a continuous physically-based model. So it uses climate data, daily and hourly climate data, and builds um, and simulates out the water balance across a representative pro profile. So we go forward one here. And um, that means that we're simulating the computer is simulating precipitation and then that water getting into the soil, lateral flow, overland flow, deep percolation. Um, and the, the simulation of that runoff then allows us to think about um, and simulate the, the erosion effects in the way the sediment is moving. Um, so we'll go one more, please. And, and we can get the sediment detachment, transport, and deposition. And all of this is at a, a daily scale. Um, which provides us a lot of complex information. Um, model also, because of this, requires complex inputs. And I'll say two other things about this kind of erosion modeling. Um, uh, it's common with erosion models to look at long-term averages, which is what we're doing. Everything we'll look at is a 30-year average. Uh, because if the model is high or low some years, it approaches um, the right values over the long term. That's been shown in the literature. And the other thing um, is absolute erosion values can be kind of difficult. So we like to think about relative erosion values. And what that means is if we're comparing one practice to another, um, the, the difference between those practices is more robust than the actual values of erosion coming out of the model. So just a couple things to think about um, as we think about this modeling process. Let's go forward one, please. 
So because the WEP model is uh, requires some complex inputs um, and is a little tricky and difficult to run, um, it's resisted some end user use. And because of this, in the same seat project, um, the hydrologic characterization tool was put together. And this is just a simplified kind of prefab um, series of runs of the WEP model to test conservation effectiveness across what was called um, a hydrologic characterization or hydro, hydraulic characteristic types um, in the watershed. And we'll get into what that means in just one moment. But basically the findings are quite interesting is the conservation practices or best management practices that are needed in the Palouse, for example, are quite different than those needed in Iowa or needed in Georgia. Um, because of changes in the climate, so the amount of water and the precipitation intensity, the, the topography, how steep and long are the hill slopes, and then also the soil characteristics, how deep are they, do they have restrictive layers, all that plays in and was shown just with some representative profiles in each of these locations, kind of what conservation is uh, effective. Let's go ahead and go forward one, please. So to dig a little bit into what these land types are and visualize it a little bit, we can expect on a characteristic profile um, that the combination, that the behavior, the erosion and runoff behavior of that profile is dictated by the combination of climate, slopes, soils, crop rotation, and best management practices. Now this is kind of foundational, foundational to uh, erosion studies. It's also baked into the more empirical um, Russell family of models. But with this land types idea, we can move from spatial data um, down to uh, erosion and runoff simulation values. Let's go ahead and go forward, please. So the, the start of this work was gathering and binning or, or creating these characteristic types of climate, slope, soils, and land use. So using publicly available spatial data, um, we then de developed categories. Um, so for example, the in climate, we looked at annual precipitation and there's a strong gradient across the Poos River watershed, drier on the west side and wetter on the east side as we get more and more orographic precipitation. And so we decided, divided it into 10 zones that we were gonna simulate separately. In the same way, we, we made bins of slope um, and soil depth and then land use um, notably with the land use, we, we um, focused on three crop rotations that also follow the precipitation gradient, a winter wheat fallow system, a winter wheat barley fallow system, and a winter wheat pea system. And so we developed input files based on this binning of spatial data. Next, please. And just a little walkthrough of our workflow and what we're doing here. We take these characteristic land types and you can see kind of the number of permutations of each that we're using and, and we take each unique combination so maybe that's a certain slope and slope length and one climate and a soil and then maybe it's a winter wheat barley fallow and it's conventional tillage without a buffer that would be one combination so we make all the possible combinations of these land types and we come up with a long list of all the combinations then using all those combinations, we put together the wet input files for each combination, and we run the model on a representative profile for each. And that allows us to construct a representative profile database. So it's a really large table of WEP simulations, um, runoff erosion simulations uh, of these representative hill slopes. Now that doesn't get us back to space yet, which is the whole whole challenge that Ryan and I set out to do is really how do we move past just using representative profiles as kind of a hypothesis testing tool? How do we get it back to space? So then on the left side of this flow diagram, using our elevation data and GIS algorithms, we find we found every flow path in the Poos River watershed. So you can see these blue area arrows. Maybe you, we can walk across the elevation data and find the flow paths. And for each of the flow paths, we use the intersections with the characteristic land types 
and gave it a name um, that links it to the unique combination of um, hydraulic characteristic land types. And by matching that name on the flow path with the representative profile, we are able to pull all the wet simulations back to space. So across this really large basin at 30 meter resolution. All right, let's go forward from there. And so if we throw it up on a map, this would just be um, all the agricultural land under conventional tillage. You can see patterns begin to emerge. Um, we grade with precipitation to the east, higher or, or more very high erosion rates. There's a little pocket in the belly of the basin where maybe we have really steep slopes. And then we can begin to test some of this best management practices. We say, well, what happens if we were to implement um, conservation buffers everywhere? And we can toggle that. We see, oh, wow, yeah, we could get some real big conservation gains by doing that kind of bulk action. But we have to ask kind of high level questions. And this 30 meter resolution map is about as effective for regional planning as it is maybe to look at your Zoom screen right now. It's just very hard to see. So what we thought we could do is um, let's pull it back out to those HUC 12 levels and we can begin to prioritize at the, at the scale that planning um, and funding might be more relevant to. We do that by thinking about, well, what is the concentration of critical source areas out of the model simulations across the basin? So we can say, oh, all the cells with erosion rates above the NRCS tolerance of erosion under conventional tillage, we'll, let's call that a critical source area for now. And we begin to see some pretty clear patterns uh, of basins that have um, higher concentrations of critical source areas than their neighbors. So for regional planning um, and long-term thinking, maybe this is, this is a place to start. This is useful information uh, for the conservation district. And then also maybe once we've selected one of these basins to work on, if there's a particular grant that's undergoing or there's outreach to particular um, producers, we could zoom in and uh, look at just one basin. And here, um, the 30 meter resolution results begin to make a lot or become to be begin to be more valuable. We can see patterns in the landscape start to show up. Maybe this would help guide field investigations. If a planner is going out to a field, you put the field boundaries on and you can say, well, these are spots in the field that I need to check um, if I haven't been out there before. And that's a really useful tool, perhaps in addition, uh, a little addition to the toolbox that planners in the district already have. So we wanted to make sure that it was really right. And uh, we're in this kind of evaluation phase now. So let's go ahead and go forward. We evaluated in a couple interesting ways. Um, so the first interesting way that Ryan and I have evaluated this modeling effort um, was by meeting with five producers across the precipitation gradient and doing a participatory mapping exercise. So we really wanted to capture even qualitatively or quant qualitatively um, the long-term observational knowledge and local expertise of producers on their fields because um, we really lack the spatial data set to validate this kind of modeling effort. And so what we did with producers at their kitchen tables or in the field and then after the pandemic, um, locked us all down on Zoom and ArcMap. We had them draw or had them point out to us as we drew the different features of erosion and runoff, short-term and long-term, that we could begin to see on the landscape or that they had observed on the landscape. So we noted wet spots and clay knobs. We noted where rills and runoff were common. And we can lay that out. Um, on the landscape. So we, we drew that physically and then we digitized some of it and we put it on the landscape. And then we could compare that back to the modeling that we've done. And we see, oh, where do we do really well and where do we miss? And this iteration of modeling, we're not picking up all those real formations so much. And those that makes some sense because we're looking at long-term averages and those real formations might occur in a single storm um, what we are really picking up is this is a pretty prog progressive producer who's already 
move many of their um, <clears throat> excuse me waterways into grass waterways that modeled as conventional tillage are showing up um, in these high red areas. So we're seeing some of that like flow accumulation, beginning of gully formation potentially um, line up with what's being seen on the field. Another point, just interesting point of uh, collecting on the ground knowledge that's really important for validating this kind of work is we're meeting with another producer who um, who's in no-till and what we were looking at conventional tillage results in his farm, um, the simulations were just showing no erosion. And it took us a minute to figure out what we had done, why this it wasn't particularly flat, there were some big flow accumulation features, what was going on. And um, the 2011 uh, na national land cover data that we had pulled from was pulled while the fields were still in CRP. So they were being mapped as grass, really low erosion rates. Um, and so some of the transient nature of land use in the, in the region is also a, a challenge, something for us to figure out with uh, this modeling effort. Okay, let me go forward, please. And the second part of the evaluation is a global sensitivity analysis. We wanna know what parameters, what, um, what characteristics are really causing the most difference or most change in erosion rates. And this looks a little complicated, but we'll just walk through it. We use, this is a regression tree. And, and really each node or each label is just splitting the, the full group of simulations into two groups that are more similar to each other than they are, um, more similar internally than they are to each other. Um, so, and, and the first split is the thing that, or, or but yeah, the first split is the thing that kind of has the most strength in terms of reducing that variance. So as we walk down this regression tree, you can see the first thing that we, we pull out is, is, is it less in this climate zone nine? And this climate zone nine is on the far east side. It's where we have most of the precipitation. But then what's also interesting about that is we began to get what Ryan was saying earlier, these hillock horizons in the shallow soils. So there's a lot more erosion potential because of the shallow soils plus um, this additional precip precipitation. And then it, it kind of follows what we know happens about erosion. And some of this is just how the model works. Um, slope becomes important or is highly important. Slope length is important. And then we're down to tillage. So best management practices. Are, are we really doing a reduced tillage or not? And what's uh, just a, a little side note is part of this project is noting that these underlying factors, the climate region, the slope, the slope length um, can really dictate there's nothing humans can do to change those things really. Um, some areas are just harder to farm without erosion and runoff coming off the field than others. And as a district, we wanna know that. We wanna know um, where just the land types characteristic makes it more prone um, to, to give off erosion or give off um, runoff that might carry um, ag chemicals. So, uh, Back from that aside, from tillage, we're back down to shallow soils. Um, crop rotation and buffers show up here at the bottom. Okay, so we can go forward from there. And we can also, we're just kind of beginning to tap the full richness of this, the simulation results. We can, we can use them to think about conservation success um, across the basin, and and this is also pulls us in line with previous pre previous publications um, of the erosion distribution and conservation effectiveness. Um, so on the left side, if we just look at the the total erosion from ag land under each, if everything was under um, one management technique, so. If we do we, on the on the y-axis on the left side, we just have massive erosion per year, um, and you can see that we get a big reduction um, going from just conventional tillage to conventional tillage with buffers. We can cut the amount of sediment going to the stream in half. Um, what's interesting is going for to conventional tillage to mulch tillage, um, you get a more than a half reduction. So that's been uh, preached by conservation districts and uh, 
academics alike, that we can get a very large reduction just by keeping some good residue on the surface. But we can get another step down by adding buffers to that mulch tillage. And then no-till to see we get really great um, reductions in erosion from conventional tillage and buffers become less important because we're already getting a lot of that water into the into the soil uh, and the soil's already got a lot of armor on okay so we think about this data in the same way on the right side um, our y-axis is the same thing it's just going to be total mass of erosion per year but now we're going to think about um the erosion production per area so we've taken the total agricultural area and, and, and normalized it from zero to 100 percent and we can add up now the erosion of each cell um, so up following up a curve we would add the the next um, erosion amount per cell and we, what we see is for all treatments 25 or 30 35 percent of the landscape is producing almost all of the erosion in all treatments. So we get the same differences in erosion that we see on the left side at 100%, um, but there's this steep marginal change in erosion um, by additional land area, which provides pretty strong evidence that there's some low hanging fruit, this kind of targeted bang for the buck approach um, holds some value. Um, so this is two ways to think about con the way conservation or conservation effectiveness might be thought about. Ryan's going to take us back out spatially now um, and, and finish up our conversation. Yeah, thanks, Ames. Um, so yeah, just from like a planning perspective and the district's perspective, uh, we just want to focus on where our practices have been and are they getting in the right locations, right? So this is just that same exact map of conservation practices installed by subwatershed. Darker colors indicate higher concentrations of conservation practices, lighter colors less. And if we overlay that map with this critical source area map that we developed, we can kind of get a, uh, just see how well we're doing. Um, and so, these watersheds that are highlighted in green would mean that they had a bunch of critical uh, critical source areas and we've put in a lot of conservation practices in those watersheds. The areas that are, the subwatersheds that are in lighter colors, yellow or light greens, um, we could maybe focus more effort in these watersheds. Uh, so maybe doing some like targeted outreach and education or just, yeah getting in touch with landowners and neighbors in those sub watersheds to try and uh, implement some more projects so yeah that's kind of where we're at at the moment um we're we're going to continue to work on this for the next eight months um and hopefully by christmas uh we'll have everything finalized and once it's all complete one of the main goals of us writing that grant was to integrate the, the results from this into the ranking process that we use for the Palouse River Watershed RCPP. So we typically get a bunch of people apply um, to receive RCPP funding and then we rank out the projects. And one of the ranking questions will include, does the project site have X number of acres of critical source areas? And if it does, then it'll get bumped, get a point bump. As I mentioned, we're going to be doing targeted outreach um, in the watersheds that are identified with a high percentage of critical source areas on ag land. Um, we're going to do some targeted mailings a couple of times um, in them, and then probably also some social media work. And then also we're working on developing an app. We're kind of testing out right now both Google Earth Engine and ArcGIS Online. And this app would let, allow planners to identify the field boundaries or the area that they're working in, and then they can see um, how effective like a, a riparian buffer would be to install in that particular field. And if that riparian buffer was also with no-till, what sort of erosion and runoff reductions would you expect? Um, so that's coming soon. And yeah, uh, with that, we'd be happy to take any questions. I put Ames and my email addresses down there. Um, yeah, and I guess the big take home is, and maybe everybody already does this, but uh, just thinking about what the land 
does on its own? What are those characteristics that kind of drive the non-point source pollutants that we all focus on? And maybe just not smashing conservation practices anywhere. Like how can we more effectively use our conservation dollars? Yeah, so with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Ryan and Ames. Um, just feel, folks, just you know, type it in, or if you uh, want to speak, I think you could maybe raise your hand. I think that's possible. <laughs> yeah, um, you can. Uh, yeah, type into the questions box, or if you'd like to just ask directly, um, raise your hand, and then we can unmute you, and um, you can just do it that way. I guess I'll just jump in with a quick a question uh, I was thinking of while you were presenting was, so do you think this kind of methodology is is kind of as repeatable anywhere? Like I, I know this is kind of you're really focused on the soil erosion side of things because that's really important for your area, but I'm thinking of folks who have other issues in other districts um, and how they can kind of take this this methodology or something to and apply it locally for them. Really good question. Um, yeah, we are really focused on erosion. I think the uh, the concepts just of like the land type, like what creates a situation that's going to drive pollutants to move through water, right? <laughs> I think those concepts could be applied. Maybe not this specific tool, but um, something similar could be used. Um, the other thing I think about often is the NRCS has this National Water Quality Initiative. And I, I know a couple of districts around the state have been working on that. And essentially what you're doing is this watershed type planning, but at like the HUP 12 watershed scale. And they require that you do some sort of analysis like this. So I think there's other tools available also. I know Whatcom has used a different one than we've used. Yeah, I do have to jump in on that um, and and just say the way the, what we've done has been designed is is using all publicly available data and the whole process um, will be hosted on GitHub when it's put together and finished. So it is, it's a little complicated and, and could be picked, but could be picked up and um, utilized anywhere that we've got the same data. So like in the contiguous 48. Uh, of the US. And we have a little development to do in terms of visualizing the runoff and lateral flow components of the model. Um, but there's some rich information there that could give us um, at least proxy information on where we would expect most of um, ag chemicals, for example, to be transported either over the soil in terms of phosphorus, perhaps, or, or through the soil if we're thinking more about nitrogen. Great. So we got a couple questions. Um, so how how long did this process take, and are the producers receptive to changing their practices when on critical source area land? Yeah, Amos, maybe you can talk about the timeline, and I can talk about the second part of that. Yeah. So this project was funded in two thousand eighteen, um, and we've gone through several different iterations of of thinking about how to get back to space. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's been a little while in the works. Um, I'm not sure if you wanted to add more to that, Ryan. No, yeah, I think we started uh, like really getting into it. It's probably taken, I don't know, a year and a half to like really get to where we are now, yeah. just to get our heads wrapped around it. Um, there were some delays with like funding and whatnot, but. And then as far as the, the producers go we haven't sent the mailers out yet um we have been doing something similar in one of the watersheds that was highlighted there through the national water quality initiative people have been really receptive actually and we usually approach it not saying like you're doing bad farming practices it's like oh the land that you farm is difficult because it soils are shallow and there's like a restrictive layer and like what could we do to minimize soil eroding um so i don't know if that 100 percent answers the question but 
that would be our approach. Okay. Um, and then the next question is, is the CRP program popular there for Im implementing buffer strips or do you use other programs as well? Um, see, I mean, CRP is really popular. And I, when I think of CRP on the Palouse, I think of more of these like uh, unfarmed eyebrows, but we do have a CREP program that we do to implement buffer strips. And then a lot of the Department of Ecology funding that we get goes to funding um, buffer strips as well. And maybe, I would say it's somewhat popular, yeah. I think there was a lot of a lot of time and energy spent ripping repairing buffers out, and maybe this hap this probably happened everywhere, and so people are a little bit reluctant to do it. But it seems like with the shift in generations in farming, people are more and more interested in planting trees and grasses along waterways. So uh, I don't know if there's any other questions. Those are the only two that came in via chat. Um, I haven't really seen any hands raised. Um, but so uh, so I, I get this is kind of another question. This is more about for me. Just curious is so I'm guessing you have a, a plan for long to kind of monitoring like what happens after these are done, or how are you going to kind of validate that the targeting was the correct method i guess yeah that's another really good question Ryan. um what i would love to do is so we have those like 30 meter grids that we can overlay on the field boundaries that we know we've like implemented uh conservation tillage on so we could we could see how many of those critical source areas that we've been treating um so that would be kind of like maybe like a first stab at like a report card. <laughs> like, oh, we've we've spent $10 million, like how well did we do? Um, and so that would be my, the first thing I think we'll do. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so, yeah. It got another question. Um, so what are some visual signs of the B1 type land? And then and so how can a how can a producer see them? Hmm, good question. So like if typically what you see is water at the bottom of a hill slope. Like it it'll be it'll almost look like in the winter well in the winter here, it'll look like a like a little wetland for a long period of time, like when the snow melts or the rain comes. Because if you think about it, the, the water doesn't always just like move straight over the soil surface, like it can move laterally through the soil too, and then it'll like form a pond at the base of the, the slope. And so that would be a good sign that you have sort of shallower soils in those areas. And the Palouse is crazy because like it, you could have that like on a north slope and then on the other side of the hill, they just won't be there. <laughs> so, yeah. So I think that'd be a good visual indication. You could also dig down and see how hard it gets <laughs> like within the first foot or so. Sometimes you'll see these like white clay type layers in there. I don't know. I, I had a question for the other folks that are maybe in the room. I don't know how much of a dialogue we can have, but I, I was just interested if any other districts around the state are doing anything to kind of like prioritize where projects go. See if we get any hands up. Um, I can kind of, I can talk about my district at least. Um, for us, 
a lot of it it really depends on other other people's uh like plans prioritization plans so things like tmdls and that kind of thing really targets at least watersheds um but we have in my experience at least i haven't really spent a lot of time trying to find the subsets within the watershed. It's that shotgun approach, but maybe it's focused in a watershed. Yeah. I, yeah, I also wanted to say, we're not like doing away with the shotgun approach. <laughs> like, I mean, it, it works to some degree, right? So uh, we're just maybe trying to focus a little bit more. But if somebody comes in and wants to do a project, there's no way we'll turn them away. Always happy to keep the doors open. Yeah, and another response we got yeah. was similar, basically currently focused around revegetating fire damage, otherwise the shotgun approach um, or intersection with wildlife habitat. Oh, nice. Yeah, I always thought that would be cool too if you could, um, yeah, we've, Ames and I have talked about this, but like building in like wildlife corridors with the buffers that we've identified with that would be useful. And I think actually Amanda Stahl is gonna talk next. She has done a bunch of work on that. So good segue. Okay. Yeah, so uh, any other questions out there for for the for uh, Ames and Ryan. Um, another response we got about the your question, um, Ryan, was uh, uh, Pierce CD has done some watershed prioritization in their farm and water quality monitoring programs. Um, I know from being on the outside, seeing if they were really trying to focus some of their work so that they could have better. Um, more concentrated application of their funding, basically. Cool. Um, but I'm not sure how they prioritize it. I imagine it's around like rec recovery plans and um, like what's the, all these other work other folks have been doing. That's how we kind of have done it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that some of the challenges in our work, right, is connecting that like regional scale planning to like the farm level and then like back and forth. I know we do that like when we write grants, like you were talking about, Ryan, like connecting them back to TMDLs and focusing on specific watersheds, but these like massive areas, it gets really hard. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, another question came through is, so will you be um, kind of publishing your work or writing it up at least? That's a good question for you, Ames. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, there's a couple publications in the work as part of my dissertation and also just to disseminate this this work out. Um, one is a more modeling focused paper um, thinking about this uh, database approach for getting web results back out. And then the other, which might be a little more relevant to, to this conversation, is um, is focused on conservation effectiveness learning and our evaluation techniques. Um, so. Those two papers are, yeah, into works and and we'll have into review hopefully soon. Yeah, just a side note on that. The funnest part of this whole project was sitting down at the table or over Zoom with these farmers, and it is insane, like what they know about a single field. Like, oh, totally. Yeah, it was just like it was amazing and really interesting. And then just getting some of the history of the farm and like what they've seen over the years, it was just like a great exercise for us and a good learning experience. 